Hello, this is Bob Lawrence. Uh, welcome back to the course. The next talk in this module will be given by Fred Kirshenman, a North Dakota organic wheat farmer and beef rancher, philosopher, and spokesman for organic sustainable farming. Fred is currently a distinguished fellow at the Aldo Leopold Center at Iowa State University and serves on the National Commission on Industrial Farm Animal Production, cooperation with the Center for a Livable Future, the Department of Environmental Health Sciences at the school. He's a marvelous spokesperson for sustainable agriculture, and in 2006 we invited him to be the annual Dodge Lecturer at the Center for a Livable Future, where he spoke on the public health implications of ecosystem change. His talk is... What does agriculture have to do with public health? Well, what a pleasure to be a part of this great series. I'm really looking forward to it. And my responsibility or my contribution to this is going to be to try and connect some of the parts of the food and health system that often don't get connected. We tend to think of agriculture separately and food separately and environment separately and health care separately. <laughs> so what I'm going to try to do is show some of the obvious connections that I think are there and hopefully uh, make a small contribution to our efforts to understand how those connections work and why they're important both to agriculture and to health care. Let's uh, start, first of all, by uh, pointing out that this is not a new idea. A long time ago, somebody who's uh, very familiar to uh, healthcare institutions said, let food be thy medicine and let medicine be thy food. And so there was that recognition way back in the time of uh, Hippocrates that these were not separate uh, silos. These were connected, that uh, food and food and health were connected. And much later in the 1940s, uh, one of my heroes, Aldo Leopold, also recognized this connection in that he defined health as the capacity of the land to renew itself. And by land, Leopold didn't just mean the dirt in the soil, he meant the whole biotic community. So everything from microbes to earthworms to vertebrates to uh, us mammals were all a part of the same system. And if the whole thing wasn't healthy, then we couldn't be healthy. And if, if the whole thing was healthy, then, um, then it was uh, likely that we could be healthy. So these are not new ideas. What has happened, however, is that we have tended to specialize and to therefore separate these various enterprises because we thought that would make them more efficient. And so in agriculture, we have come up with a paradigm of production, which we call the modern paradigm or the industrial paradigm. And here's a statement that pretty much captures that paradigm from uh, two authors who I will point out in a minute. One of them happens to be a friend of mine, which I want to indicate in the interest of full disclosure. But here's how they describe in one of their papers the modern in agriculture system. Modern agriculture has become highly industrialized in order to reliably produce the largest amount of plant and animal product possible while minimizing labor inputs. And that's always been the goal. The goal has been yield, producing as much as possible and to do that with as little labor as possible. They go on to say, through the incorporation of numerous components manufactured externally to the farm, including fertilizer, fertilizers, pesticides, and technology, the modern system manipulates the land to make it amenable to the industrial processes. And so here again, these are all important points that we have a lot of inputs that are enormously energy intensive that drives this system and that has made it successful over the last 60 years or so. And then they go on to say, typically crops are produced as large hectareage monocultures consisting of single genotype planted across an entire field. So this is that highly specialization, not only in terms of biodiversity, there's really no biodiversity, but also in terms of genetic diversity. We really are looking for just a few traits to do those few things, and, name, and the primary one being yield, so produce as much as possible. Most farms using modern agriculture methods cultivate only a few crops grown in simple rotations, such as wheat fallow or maize soybean. So most farmers now are producing one or two commodities at most, and they specialize in that, and then using these inputs, make it produce as much as possible. Similarly, most animals are grown in feedlots or climate-controlled buildings in order to closely monitor feed efficiency and to guarantee uniform meat, egg, and milk products. So here again is increased productivity, uniform product 
quality so that when you go into the grocery store, at least some people tell us everybody wants that pork chop all exactly the same size or those apples all the same size and all the same color. And so part of what industrial agriculture tries to do is to uh, provide that specialization. Cycling nutrients is not a major consideration of most industrial agriculture systems because the addition of externally derived fertilizers is cheaper and simpler than collecting, storing, and using manure. And this is David Keller and uh, Charlie Brummer, who in their paper on putting food production in context in Bioscience Magazine, this is their description, and this is a very accurate description of how the modern industrial food system works. So it's highly specialized, simplify the system as simply as possible, and then economies of scale. So those are the three fundamental principles of industrial agriculture or any kind of industrial economy, actually. Those are the basic principles. So what's wrong with this? Uh, I mean, this has been very successful in terms of increasing yields. Uh, you know, we have uh, tripled and some inches quadrupled the yields of corn and wheat and rice, uh, these basic uh, grain staples uh, over the years, and we have increased the efficiency of our meat production with this system. So what, what's wrong with the system? Well, first of all, let's take a look at what it does on the landscape. This is now what typical farms look like in the, in the farm belt. Here's a soybean field, as you can see, as far as the eye can see. This is what happens with this kind of specialization. There are people who think this is beautiful, so from an aesthetic perspective, that may be uh, desirable on part of some people. Some people that I know who drive across Iowa and all they see is... Uh, soybean fields like this and corn fields and they think it's pretty boring. But it has some other implications, which we'll come to in a minute. But this is what it looks, this is what the landscape looks like. Here's a typical corn field, again, as far as the eye can see, all corn, one commodity, very specialized kind of system. Animal systems look very much the same. We crowd animals together into feedlots in order, again, to get those efficiencies and that quality control that we want. So there's livestock. Here's poultry, a typical poultry barn. Again, this kind of specialization, concentrating um, animals together in to, to achieve those efficiencies. Here's hogs the same way. These are very typical operations now throughout much of the farm belt. So the question that we need to ask is, uh, despite this success in terms of increasing our yield, what have been some of the downsides? What are some of the negative impacts? And, of course, there are some. First of all, there are impacts on the soil. If you have large fields of a single crop, particularly if it's had a fair amount of cultivation, then you get a fast rain, and this is what they, this is what happens in the field. You get this kind of soil erosion. And we have now, in a state like Iowa, lost about half the topsoil in the last 50 years. Now, farmers, to their credit, have tried to take some corrective actions around this without changing the system, they go to no-till agriculture, maybe doing a little better job with the cover crops occasionally. But still, when you've got this larger acreage exposed at the same time, you're going to see some, uh, you're going to see some soil erosion. Here's another example of, you know, when you have an area in the field where the water collects and runs down uh, downhill, some uh, fairly significant soil erosion. This is not as uncommon as we would like to think it is. So this is one of the impacts, what's happening to our soil. Another impact has been pointed out by the United Nations Millennium Ecosystem Assessment Report. Now, it's a very large report, and uh, probably none of the students taking this course are going to read the whole report. But fortunately, they, they did a synthesis report, which came out in March of 2005. And it's only about 70 pages and has an executive summary. But here's the core. And, and, and this was a report that was put together by almost 1,400 of our leading scientists from 95 countries. So this is not a report that you can dismiss easily. They worked four years developing this report. And here was their core finding, which begins to help us understand part of the impact, part of the negative impacts of this kind of agriculture. Their core finding said that over the last half centuries, humans have polluted or overexploited two-thirds of the Earth's ecological systems on which life depends, dramatically increasing the potential for unprecedented and abrupt ecological collapses. Approximately 60% of ecosystem services evaluated are being degraded or used unsustainably. In other words, we can't continue this, this kind of an operation. Most ecosystem changes, they go on to say, were the direct or indirect result of changes made to meet growing demands of ecosystem services, in particularly growing demands for food, water, timber, fiber, and fuel. In other words, what the report is telling us is that the very methods that we have used to produce this successful agriculture in terms of 
increasing our productivity is the very system which has undermined the ecological resources that increase that productivity. So obviously, if you look at the report this way, we can't continue this because we keep undermining the very resources that make it possible for us to main- maintain productivity. And it's our effort to grow food and timber and fiber and fuel, you know, and, and two-thirds of those are agriculture-related activities. We can't continue that. And then the report goes on to say that the solutions aren't going to be simple. Solutions will be complex. There is no simple fix to these problems since they arise from the interaction of many recognized challenges, including climate change, biodiversity loss, and land degradation. And so what they're saying to us here is that things like climate change are not isolated phenomenon. They are part of this way in which we have used the planet to produce our food and our fuel and our fiber. And then they go on to say that, furthermore, the loss of species and genetic diversity, here now we come back to that specialization in agriculture where we've lost both species diversity and genetic diversity, and the result which that has had is that it decreases the resilience of ecosystem services, the level of disturbance that an ecosystem can undergo without crossing a threshold to a different structure of functioning. And that's the part that we really have to pay attention to because what this study is saying is that what's happening now is that at the same time that we're degrading these resources, uh, these ecological resources on which food production depends, we have also reduced the diversity which makes it possible for nature to rebound from that degradation. And so it's going to be much more difficult for nature to respond to restore its vitality. And that could then take us to a point where, and we know this has happened in the past, there have been at least five extinction periods in the past when nature had to come back from that you know, 90, in some instances, over 90% of species, existing species were lost. And so when the planet came back from that, because there was no resilience there, it came back as something very different from what it was before. It's one of the reasons that we lost the dinosaurs, because it was one of those extinction periods. The way that nature came back was not conducive for dinosaurs to continue living on the planet. So we often talk about saving the planet. This is not about saving the planet. The planet's going to be fine, and the microbes will bring it back to life again if we seriously disrupt it. The question is whether or not what it comes back as will be conducive for mammals to continue to exist on the planet. So this is serious stuff. This isn't, so when we think about, the point I want to make here is that when we think about the kind of agriculture that we're practicing, it isn't just about, well, it would be nice if we were kinder to the environment. This is really going to affect us very directly and whether or not we continue on the planet. And then, of course, they go on to say, if that weren't bad enough, that more challenges are on the way. At the same time, it's anticipated that during the next 50 years, demand for food crops will grow by 70 to 85 percent and demand for water between 30 and 85 percent. And the reason for that, of course, is we anticipate a further explosion of the human population. So the question then becomes, how do we maintain an adequate amount of productivity given these challenges. And to me, this means we have to fundamentally change the way we do agriculture. We can't continue the way we're doing it very much farther into the future. Now, there are other problems, too, that are a part of this with this concentration of animals. We have, of course, a concentration of manure, and one of the ways to do that in many of these systems is to create these manure lagoons, when the manure from these buildings then goes into the lagoons. And if you have an exceptional amount of rainfall, they often overflow. And then you have uh, this phenomenon where the rivers and streams that these flow into then cause fish kills, and so it has a profound effect um, on the environment. So these are all connected. And then, of course, one of the things we need to recognize, again, is something that Aldo Leopold recognized already back in the 1940s, is that there is a relationship here between density and ecology. And as he pointed out here in this quote, which I love, he says, the trend in animal ecology shows, he says, with increasing clarity that all animal behavior patterns, as well as most environmental and social relationships, are conditioned and controlled by density. I have studied animal populations for 20 years and have yet to find a species devoid of maximum density controls. In all species, one is impressed by one common character. If one's means of reduction fails, another takes over. So what Leopold has discovered by studying nature is that in all of nature, if you have a dense population of any species, whether it's in, and he doesn't say plants here, but it's also true of plants, whether animal or plants, 
then nature wants diversity because diversity is what it thrives on. So it will reduce that density of population by introducing some kind of disease or pest to reduce it. And so what's actually happening out there in these highly specialized agricultural systems which have these dense species of plants and animals is that nature is constantly introducing pests and diseases. And so farmers have to then turn around and bring in controls to try to control those which have a direct effect on human health, which we'll get to in a minute. Now, this was not just Leopold blowing smoke back in the 1940s. Here's David Tillman now writing in our present time in an article which he published in Nature magazine, which he's saying essentially the same thing as uh, Leopold. He says, the principles of ecology, epidemiology, evolution, microbiology, and soil science operate in agroecosystems as well as in natural systems. In other words, farms operate the same way as natural systems. Although the owners of the businesses were probably shocked, I doubt if epidemiologists were surprised that Hong Kong chicken operations housing up to a million genetically similar chickens, here again is that specialization, were susceptible to a rapid and devastating outbreak of disease last year. He's saying this should not surprise us. And then he went on to say, when those running massive livestock operations realize that chronic disease and catastrophic epidemics are the expected result of high densities and low diversity, and when society restricts the release of pollutants from such operations, it may again be profitable for individual farmers or neighborhood consortia of farmers to have mixed cropping and livestock operations tied together in a system that gives an efficient, sustainable, locally closed nutrient cycle. So what David Tillman is saying here is that as this current system starts to break down because of this disease-related phenomenon where density, uh, specialization and density produce more and more diseases, it becomes more and more difficult for farmers to sustain that kind of agriculture. And as that plays itself out, we may again find ourselves going back to somewhat smaller farms, more diversified farms, operating in accordance with nature's principles. And I think that's exactly what will happen. The current industrial systems will only survive so long as we have the cheap energy to support them. And as we all know, costs of energy are going up as we um, reach peak uh, global oil production. So how does this relate then to health? Well, here's one of the key ways. Newsweek magazine had it on the cover of their magazine a couple of years ago, Antibiotics, the End of Miracle Drugs. And what farmers need to do in order to keep these large dense operations of animals going is to feed them antibiotics, not because they're ill, but to prevent them from getting ill and also to promote their growth. And so, as we'll see in a minute, most of the antibiotics that are used today are used to sustain these animal operations. And here we are. Here is what the uh, Union of Concerned Sciences in their study have pointed out. As you can see, the vast majority of antibiotic use is for non-therapeutic animal feed. Up to, well, about 80% of antibiotics are used for that purpose. They are used for ill animals as a therapy, but a very, very small percentage and for human use. So as this antibiotic resistance develops, it's clearly from these kinds of production systems. And of course, then there are many pathways through which the antibiotic resistance gets into us, into humans, through our food, through workers who handle feed and manure, etc., and of course, through the environment. So we can't protect ourselves from this because it's part of all of these, um, these pathways that we get exposed to uh, these resistant bacteria. And this is one of the reasons that increasingly our healthcare institutions are concerned about how our food is produced. It's not the only reason, but it's one of the reasons. Because if physicians lose antibiotics as a tool to deal with disease, then we have a huge, huge problem on our hands. And then, of course, one of the other related issues is the foodborne illnesses which come from this system. And uh, as you can see here from this uh, government study, we have an estimated over 75 million cases yearly of foodborne illnesses, 325,000 people who require hospital care, and 5,000 deaths yearly just from foodborne illnesses. And it's part of this system that we've created. So we have a number of physicians now who are speaking out about this and um, starting to try to help us to think about how we change our, our food and agriculture system. And Ronald Glasser from uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota, is one of those who has spoken out. And this is from an article in Harper's Magazine back in July 2004. And he says, medical historians describe the last few decades as the age of the emerging plagues. Overpopulation, poverty, ecological devastation, and global climate change, chemical pollution, and industrial agriculture. 
all of these factors conspire to create the conditions of unprecedented death by infectious disease. And he's saying that it is actually public health, a public health approach, which has the best opportunity to deal with because in, in our public health approach, we tend to look at systems and what causes illness in the system rather than simply the therapy. And I'll, we'll uh, touch on that a little bit later. So what this says to us then is that we have a systems problem here that we have to deal with. We can't solve this simply by making a few modifications in our, in our system. The system that we put together, in fact, was a response over a period of uh, almost two centuries to Thomas Malthus' warning that we were headed toward famine because population was growing faster than our capacity to produce food. And so we geared up you know, all of our efforts and we, we invented synthetic fertilizers and we put these specialized systems in place, reduced the amount of labor required in order to accomplish that. And we did that. You know, we, in a way, we should pat ourselves on the back. What we forgot about was to look at this system from an ecological systems perspective and what were the unintended consequences of that system. And the unintended consequences were some of these, uh, and, and we'll, we'll look more directly at, at uh, the impact it had on human health, has on human health. But it is a system that promotes disease, that promotes soil erosion, and, and has, um, you know, an impact, therefore, on human health and, and, and ecological health.